much for joining us today. Uh, we're absolutely delighted to be um, doing this presentation as part of GDS Services Week. Just a bit of housekeeping from me before we get going. Um, so we'll start the presentation in the next couple of minutes. And then um, there's a, if you notice on your kind of toolbar, there's a Q&A section. So as and when we're going through the presentation, if there are any questions that you've got, please drop them in there. Um, and then we'll do a bit of a Q&A at the end where um, I'll relay some of the questions to, uh, to, to Richard, Sarah and, and Martin, and then we can, um, we can answer some of those. If we don't manage to get around to, to all of them, uh, after this presentation, please do follow up with us or we'll be able to communicate with you um, via the email addresses that you've all provided in order to answer those questions as well. Um, I think that's it. Uh, we should expect the presentation to be around 35, 40 minutes, and then we'll get into the, uh, the Q&A at the end. So big thank you again for joining, and hopefully you'll all enjoy it. So without further ado, Sarah, over to you. Thank you very much, Ben. So uh, just a few introductions. So I'm Sarah Slack. I'm the Assistant Director of Digital Delivery here at Homes England. Uh, we'll introduce ourselves as we go through the presentation today. But uh, I think it's just, uh, I'm just going to add that I'm, I'm the warm up act for today's session. So um, the main act is data later. So I am going to make you wait a bit longer for that. And uh, we appreciate we've got the post lunch lull slot. Um, so we want to invigorate you a little bit here uh, and give you start by giving you a bit of background to Homes England and specifically how we do digital change. Okay. Thanks, Ben. Um, so I'm not going to read out everything verbatim what's on the slide there, but I suppose our, our main um, strap line at the moment is our mission is making homes happen. Um, and what we actually do by helping that is facilitating and driving conversations, bringing together different agencies and departments that help unlock the land in previously hard to develop spaces and to also make the best use of government owned land as well. Uh, one of the interesting facts when I joined um, Homes England 18 months ago was that we're the fifth largest building society and that's something that wasn't really known to me until I actually came here. Um, as an executive agency um, we work closely with the ministry so we take a mission-led approach to making those homes happen as well and just to give you a bit of background you'll see help to buy on the bottom of that slide some of the services that we're actually responsible for including help to buy we've also delivered the building safety private sector cladding remediation fund uh, how, affordable housing uh, as well as digital and technology services not only for homes england but for also for the regulator of social housing as well thanks ben next slide okay so th this is a bit of a vision um, that we have for uh, digital delivery. And I have to say, I have added at the bottom there, this is a bit of a mashup from good things that I've seen across Twitter over the years. So this is a mashup of other people's uh, digital vision. So thank you to everyone if you recognize something in there that is yours. Um, but what we wanted to do is actually take all the best bits and get our team to get to sign up to this as a vision, which they have done, which is great. Next slide, please, Ben, thanks. Okay, so we're not just a technology team, but we're a fantastic group of people who've single-handedly been delivering, supporting and maintaining products and systems. Uh, and it's fair to say that in the past, this digital team were a small group of people. Um, we're quite a large number of contractors who've been, been embedded in the team and have been here for a number of years. And up until two years ago, our whole digital change and roadmap was actually being led by consultants and suppliers. And, you know, although there were good intentions, they were struggling to embed and direct any real change from a digital aspect. So it's also fair to say that, you know, at this time where we were, there was almost no cross-government collaboration happening at a professional level. Thanks, Ben. Okay, so what progress have we made? So I touched on earlier, I've been at Homes England for just over 18 months. Um, we've got a really strong um, digital leadership team now, and I'm really proud to say it's 60% female. Um, and we're focused in four specific areas, digital delivery, data, technology, and digital operations. And we've got a strong headcount structure that aligns to these areas as well. So permanent recruitment has been a real priority over the last year and all of our roles are aligned to the DDAP profession capability framework and our digital capability has also been a key objective, um, focusing on investing in our online digital technology training platform, as well as seeking out coaching and shadowing opportunities through professional networks. Okay. So, oh no, sorry, back again. <laughs> sorry. I think, no, I think I was taking a... 
a big pause, sorry. Uh, so a huge achievement has been bringing in spend control assurance uh, to the organisation and delivering to the digital service standards. Um, we've got a recruited and dedicated experienced spend control assurance lead now in digital, and we've signed up to version five of the spend assurance pipeline. So we're busy growing our internal capability around assessments, and we acknowledge we've still got a lot more work to do in engaging the wider organisation, but it is actually all moving in the right direction, which is fantastic. Um, we've now, a, a huge move for us has been moving away from technology team approach to having multidisciplinary teams and that structure to deliver all of our digital change projects. And the most important one, I suppose, here today as well, our partnership uh, with our suppliers, and in this case, BJSS. So the multidisciplinary team is the basis for our one team approach when engaging with partners, helping us deliver our digital outcomes. We don't yet have the necessary skills or professions in house, so working with suppliers is a true partnership for us. And there's a real focus on shared goals and knowledge transfer will ensure that we're delivering um, services and systems that are sustainable. Thanks, Ben. So what are the things that are next steps for us? So one of the things that we're actually starting to focus on is service teams, and we've just started on this journey and thinking about it, and we can already see how it needs to iterate in the near future. Our service teams are currently sat around products that sit in specific directorates, but this is a first step in building out our roadmaps to see what the potential tactical strategic deliverables are and for these to be prioritised by business areas. We know it's not going to be easy. We see the challenges across government, but we're starting small. We're going to be working in the open and collaboratively. And more important, we know it's going to be OK if it fails. We want to try something to have a different approach. Improving the diversity of our teams. Oh, sorry, Ben. Sorry, sorry, Sarah. Well, I need to take a breath because I'm like... <laughs> talking not, so. That was an accident that time. That's my fault. <laughs> Hands are off the I'm keyboard. Too, I'm too slow. Um, <laughs> so the diversity of our teams, this one's fantastic. I mean, if anyone follows me on social media, you know, Homes England, we're now a signatory of the Tech Talent Charter. And this is a fantastic, huge achievement for our women in digital network who've all been working extremely hard. And, you know, I know that this person is signed up to the event today, so I hope she hears this big shout out, Emma Tilly. Uh, she's our network chair uh, and her and the team have invested so much of their personal time and putting so much effort to make it happen. Um, you know, as part of the Tech Talent Charter, we've already identified actions around recruitment processes and activities. Um, I'm not going to go into any more detail here because um, I think that's its own show and tell in its own right. So I don't want to steal any thunder from that team. Um, so on that note, um, and just before I hand over to the main act, Richard Brown, I just want to say in, in true government fashion, I will have to leave uh, this presentation to go and join another meeting where I'm needed elsewhere. But if anybody does want to reach out to me with any questions or wants to join up with any of the work that we're doing across government, I'm really, really happy to have those conversations. So thank you very much for having me. I'm going to stay on the presentation for another 20 minutes and then I'll drop off. And I'm going to hand over to you now, Richard Brown, the main act. I don't think main act is the, the best description of me coming forward, but yeah, that, 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 thank, thanks for that, Sarah. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be sort of the next warm up to act before we move on to the sort of the main sort of uh, part with Martin's going to take us through. But yeah, for those for those um, I don't know, my name's Richard Brown. I'm assistant director for data at Homes England. Um, I've been in place uh, since about June last year, so I could still consider myself a newbie um, to the world, but I can't use that excuse for much longer. Um, I'm going to sort of I'm sort of responsible for sort of our data strategy and our sort of approach to data across across Homes England, trying to modernise the way we use data. I'll come and talk a little bit more of that in a moment. Um, I'm responsible for sort of trying to raise data literacy across the organisation and, and sort of building a sort of strong central data capability function in our digital um, and team. But generally, really, I'm just like sort of passionate and an evangelist for data and I'm not just data for data's sake, but for data that makes a difference, um, hopefully to people's lives. But in the first instance, to our organisation to make it sort of achieve its mission. And then that there on the screen there is sort of our sort of tagline around data and what we do in our data strategy is by ensuring that so it's, it's sort of aligned. Everything's aligned to our digital work. It's not just sort of separate entities happening and going off in different directions. We try to bring it all together and it's about being insight led. And that's a deliberate word, insight led rather than data led, because I think it's about that. It's what you use the data for to actually drive sort of decision making and um, hopefully evaluation, that sort of stuff moving forward. What I'm going to do before we bring Martin is really give a sort of context view of, of, of data at Homes England and, and why we felt a modern data platform was something that we needed. Um, um, especially, I think, 
because you know, it, it's, it's something that you, people sort of often go off and do and think it's something they need to put an end in itself. And I said, no, actually, we, you've got to be really, really clear about why you need something data infrastructure and why you need to build something. I'm going to sort of give that sort of context. And really, isn't the sort of thing, this is the amazing stuff we're doing. I'm sure other people on the call and people watching the video are, are already on their journey around data platform, data infrastructure. But it's really sort of an honest appraisal of where our initial sort of steps we've been making on this, where we feel we are. And hopefully we can sort of learn, share that knowledge and outside of this course, share that knowledge completely as we move forward. So, yeah, if we go into the next one, please, uh, Ben. Thank you, Chris. Chris uh, yeah, so thanks. Um, um, yeah, so I, want, I, don't, I don't want to give this sort of this impression that Homes England was a, a sort of, you know, not doing anything with data or not using data. Of course it was. And some brilliant people doing brilliant things with data at Homes England. Um, for those that don't know the agency, it's come through a number of iterations over a number of years um, from different, you know, from English partnerships with HCA, bringing things together, things splitting off. And it's actually gone through a whole load of change over the last like 20 years. And so by nature, the sort of digital and data structures of those things do sort of come fragmented and brought together fragmented and stuff. So there's a lot of change that's had to be dealt with over the last number of years. But as I said, there's absolutely brilliant things, some brilliant products, um, People like you know where about our, our, the, the, our land hub sort of work around data. We've got we got sort of um, all our sort of services are really well digital led, um, and we've got some great networks across government and some history of working in the open. But what I would say is that there isn't that sort of strategic view from that, and I think people have been working really well, really well, sort of in perhaps in their own area and not sort of holistically across Homes England. I think that's probably fair to say, and we've got a real sort of wide spectrum. Of skills and capabilities. So we've got so on one hand people doing really advanced stuff around digital twin work, 3D modeling, bit of data science. And then other parts of the business, we're still running off spreadsheets and really struggling with that. So we've got this real sort of capability gap that we need to sort of try and address and sort of try and bring together. And I think that's because we haven't really got a, a robust, or didn't have a robust information and data strategy that sits around and enables us to bring everybody along to the same sort of, sort of assess where we are and have that vision of where we want to get to. I think the last couple of bullet points around sort of, yeah, we've got a complex data estate, as I said, we've got something like 30 circa on-premises systems, uh, you know, three, three, 250 universes, thousands of, we're using data very, very, very sort of, sort of old way in many respects, and that we perhaps need to bring that on a bit more with some of the modern tooling, and that's, that's why this project comes, it's come to fruition. Um, the last one, and anybody again, who's, um, like Sarah saying, follow social media, this is something I've got really passionate about in the last, last few weeks, is that really understanding the value of our data and understanding that, you know, it's, 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 it's not just a thing on its own that sits there and just, it's actually got, a, when you use it, when you put context in, when you curate it, you actually have, actually has a, a sort of an economic and social benefit to the organization. And by knowing what that benefit is, that's when you can really bring people on in your journey to actually, to, to, to make things better and, and build a sort of business, a sort of use, sort of a, uh, a case for change to doing things around data and infrastructure. So I think people who, who are starting on this journey in sort of daily leadership roles, that is a really key thing, a driver for doing a lot of this work, getting a real corporate understanding of the value of the data in it, treating it properly as an asset. Next slide, please, uh, Ben. Again, anybody who's um, going to start off in a sort of leadership role, I would definitely recommend sort of an enterprise information um, a management maturity assessment. Okay, just a baseline of where you are. I was very lucky. This was sort of in place as I came here, so I've got a real sort of big to-do list. And this is this is this is the um, maturity assessment that's taken place for um, Homes England. Coming on down the left, um, um, all the usual things that people probably be aware of from uh, EIM model, maturity model, a uh, vision, use cases, the setup around analytics, governance, infrastructure, and the ecosystem. And as you can see on the right, I'm going to do every single one in detail because we're going to sort of focus on the infrastructure today. But we've got a to-do list across all those different areas. And that really then, as we'll see in a minute, informs our strategy about what we're going to do and when and how. OK, so, um, yeah, no sort of real clear vision of where we want to get to inform data information. Um, no sort of structured roadmap about how we're going to get there. So if we do build a, a, a data platform, what's the roadmap? What are we going to do? What's the use cases? What's the things we need to do and moving forward? Data management, again, if we're going to really, really, truly benefit from our data, we've got to treat data as an asset and put proper um, information asset management methodologies behind that. So data ownership, data trusteeship, data stewardship. We've got to really get people to own the data, not see this chasm of, you know, data is always a business thing because it's on their systems and business thinking, oh, it's an IT thing or digital thing because they look after the systems. It's not that. We're going to lose things in the chasm between it. So you've got to really sort of bridge that gap to make data everybody's issue. 
but yeah, it's the infrastructure. That's the main, the main sort of thing. We've got you know data sources decentralized. I mentioned numerous different systems. Um, we've got um, lack of trust. You know, because people don't trust the system, they don't use it. Because they don't use it, the data quality gets worse. Because data quality gets worse, they don't trust it. So it's this circle of distrust with our data that we need to really, really un un unpick. But yeah. That's this decentralized, disaggregated view of data is something we really, really needed to change. Yes, Ben, next, next slide, please. Right. Um, this is a scribble I did um, when, when I first started um, in a role. It's sort of like it's just sort of taken legs and I sort of use it. Um, kind of and it's not nothing new to many people. People have seen this in other places. But this is a sort of like a now and future state we want to get to in terms of how we use our resources around data information. This is a graph, as you can see, on along the uh, x-axis, along this should get that right, the x-axis on, on the bottom, that is our sort of value chain of what we're doing with data and how you get to turn it from its raw components to getting, getting value out of it and then actually driving decision-making. So you go from extracting the data from wherever it sits, transforming it, then doing that descriptive analytic piece of saying what happened yesterday, Diagnostic analytics sort of saying, you know, why that happened. So you, we, we built 100 homes in the last month. It was below target. Diagnostic saying why it's below target. Then we started moving into more complex stuff around actually developing inferences on it. Um, you know, sort of moving a sort of a more forward thinking, forecasting view of it, um, a foresight view, sorry, of, of analytics. And then you're driving action. Now the, up, the Y axis is a resource or, 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 or sort of, I think it's just as the, the amount of effort, I think more than resource, probably a better description. And the blue line is showing at the moment, all our effort is getting data out of its systems. It's doing that transforming. So people bringing data out into spreadsheets, mashing it together into, into, into spreadsheets um, because it's on multiple different systems. And that is where we get most of our resources, not the value end where we actually want to get things out of our data and actually drive decisions. And if you wanted to sort of really drive insight-led decision-making at Homes England. We need to shift our resource at the value chain. So we're getting, we're getting actual sort of inter, inference development and data-driven action out of our data rather than spending most of our time in the weeds and the spreadsheets pushing it together. And that's again, where the technologies of a modern data platform we feel could help us on that journey. Next slide, Ben. I'm not gonna get this again. This is our, this is our draft data strategy, which is going, is going for approval soon. Um, I'm not going to go into detail because I want to get onto the platform bit. We've got sort of five key areas though, again, and again, not, not probably new to many people, but it's got to be driven on the top left by a strong vision. And that's going to be led from, from the, the exec down through the different, the different sort of corporate groups. They're driving what needs to happen. We're, we're supporting that and building that and to, for, to take it forward. Information asset management, I've gone out to death, valuing data as an asset, understanding its, its, um, its benefit economically and socially to us, but also putting management governance in place. Don't just create governance for governance sake and use a governance that's already there, but, but making sure people understand what their role is in that governance is the most important bit there. Top right architecture, absolutely. So we're gonna you know, start in a new platform, which is this project. We're gonna talk about master data management eventually about what, you know, bringing some key assets together that are used to cost the business. Um, and then the sort of more sort of analytics model and looking at sort of where our data resources are what skills do we need and, 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 then, and then how do you want to fill it? Do we want to create a data science capability and advanced analytics? You know, have we already got that? You know, all of that sort of stuff needs to be sort of formalized and crystallized. And then the bottom one from I'm absolutely passionate about is data literacy, not just about data, data resource, but wider than that, the people who are using our information. Let's stop, I know I've probably used data analytics buzzword bingo all the way through this presentation but we've got to start talking in plain English and start talking to people about you know to really sort of them understand that data isn't that thing that people do in a dark room over there like me it's actually all our business and it's so important that we need to take it forward next slide Ben and then yeah I'll just I'll just skip over this one but this is our vision really about from that strategy is that we want to see the development of of, of, um, of insight from data as a service so it looks as like you would any service. Our users are internal users. We have, a, you know, might have gone about the user required user uh, research we've done to identify those role profiles and role personas. But you know, we've got different people need different needs off our data and insight. Let's treat it as a service. Let's get, you know, make sure it's user led, make it user designed. But that, excuse me, at the end of the day, it's on a strong foundation around that platform. Which brings us on to the next next slide as well, please, Ben. Cheers. Before I bring Martin in. So, what's your vision? So. You really should, const I constantly ask myself, and I think it's really true you should do this every day, do we need a data platform? No, do we need a data platform at Homes England? Is it something, you know, central data platform, something that we need and why, you know? Um, and 
I think that's really important because it's, it, you need to focus on, you know, what the, the, the purpose and need of it is and, and what benefits it's going to bring. OK, as I said, there, don't build stuff because other people have told you to do it. It's, you know, it's, it, it feels right. And um, because, you know, more importantly, close your ears, BJSS, other people are telling you it's the right thing for you to do. You know, you need to own this yourselves as organisations. That's the right thing to do. And benefits, in my view, you have to start quantifying those benefits. OK, it's not about just saying, oh, it's going to, you know, single version of the truth, all these brilliant words. It makes sense. It's that quantifiable benefit it's going to bring you as an organization, because if you build a very expensive platform, it's going to cost lots and lots of lots of money. And you're not you're reviewing that cost. In the end, it just becomes like, you know, something that just 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 a drain money drain. And it doesn't actually bring you any kind of benefit to the organization. So here's the clear benefits. And in my view. Well, it is for you. We've, we sort of benchmark these to sort of get that sort of quantifiable view of, of how the impact it will have. So we feel, and our inference is that having a platform reduces manual effort to abuse analytics. Okay, so we know how long it takes different parts of the business at the moment to produce certain reports and certain analytics, and how long it takes to do that. Okay, and you can get a quantifiable cost of that based on the hours and things it takes to do that. We can't do it for everything, but you can get this sort of benchmark and then use cases on the platform to benchmark that against. Okay. It streams like the amount you spend on existing reporting solutions. Okay, so your initial in, your initial investment might be expensive, but over time you can understand how that might bring cost and reduce reduce cost over over, over time. Okay. Um, obviously, at the moment we sort of have a data platform, if you'd like. So it's not that we're creating a data platform; we're creating a modern one. So we have a data platform, but it's on premises. It's you know it's primarily about and people using Excel and that sort of side of things, and obviously. We all know the benefits of moving to cloud generally in cost of storage or things like that, you know, scalability or the usual benefits of cloud. And this hopefully will bring us some, uh, uh, excuse me, some, um, some benefits around, around that as well. The second one is probably less easy to quantify, but still vitally important. Now, we can secure our data more, class, uh, more effectively in the new solution. So what we can do, we can, we can um, now secure our data, our sensitive data and sensitive um, classifications in our data, in our, in our data platform. OK, and um, we can split that data up from a system and say, you know, storage different parts of the same database separately. And now different people, different user personas contact the information that they need to do. So people who don't need access to sensitive data can still do analytics and analysis on the data without ever touching that, that sensitive data. OK, only the people who need that sensitive data and, um, can have it. We've also got benefits like change data capture, which I think um, Martin will talk about, uh, that you have the data warehouse. We've got all those sort of benefits as well. And then the last one, it's just, it's just uh, really big, it's sort of enabling um, sort of um, different user personas to access different in, uh, data or information or insight in the way that, that is best for them, okay? User-led at the end of the day. Now this vision is a vision. We're going to the, the Alpha project now, which Martin's gonna take us through. But we will not be scared to pivot that decision or change that decision if, if it doesn't have a clear economic benefit or social benefit from what we do as an organization okay we won't just continue we will not be we don't we don't mind changing and, and direction and that's a great agile delivery as far as i'm concerned okay but we, but we have to have that vision of what we're trying to achieve and understand and mike's going to hopefully now take us through um, the more detail and be more interested than i am so i'm going to hand over to 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 martin now thank you richard I'm not sure if I will be more interesting than you. Uh, you're a very good speaker. Uh, nevertheless, uh, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Martin Siran. I'm a technical manager uh, at BJSS and I'm helping uh, Homes England to deliver the new data uh, platform service. So uh, Richard can realize his uh, brilliant vision and strategy he has just uh, talked about. Next slide, Ben. Thanks. Uh, I would like to speak a bit more about the delivery itself and how we structure the delivery, uh, what's the timeline for the alpha phase of the project. And so uh, the first phase really was the mobilization. So uh, we started uh, back uh, in December last year. And the first week, besides you know uh, getting people on board, um, was to really understand the vision and the strategy Holmes England uh, have or Richard has. Uh, so we know uh, what's the what's the goal of the project. So we understand where we are within the organization. So we understand what's what's the, what's the goal. What are the project objectives? So we can focus uh, focus uh, on those. Um, and also, it's very important in the first really days to understand the broader aspect of the of the organization. Where the project uh, where the project is. What are the other projects uh, related to us? What are the key dependencies? What are our constraints? 
you know, what are our limitations uh, at our work, who we need to talk to, who we need to interact with. So really to understand key risk and dependencies and also uh, to understand key stakeholders uh, who we need to speak uh, with or who we needed to speak with in later stages uh, in discovery and delivery phases. Um, but also it's important to say that onboarding these times when everybody works, uh, you know, remotely is, is can be a challenge. Um, because obviously we are entering a new organization, we don't know anybody, but we are very pleased that Homes England were very welcoming and help us to really navigate through their organization, help us to get in touch with other people and also people from different, um, different departments, units, uh, projects uh, were really open and willing to talk to us and we were really engaging with us, which is obviously very important for these kind of projects. So after our mobilization, um, uh, phase, which was really the first uh, one or two weeks, uh, we entered the discovery. And so based on our stakeholder mapping, uh, we made a plan for our user research and technical assessment. So those were the two activities which are running in parallel for next um, uh, six weeks. So user research, very important, as Richard, uh, Richard mentioned, we don't want to just deliver a technical solution, a data platform, which will bring the data from you know one side to another. Uh, and we do some calculations and then uh, it will make no difference for the users and basically uh, nothing will change for them. So in order to uh, deliver for the end users, for the people who will use the data platform service, we had to do a user research to understand what are the current needs and pain points of different sorts of people or roles uh, uh, which currently work with the data or with the current uh, data platform. Uh, alongside that, we also had a similar discussion, but on the technical level to uh, understand what are the Homes England technical capabilities at the moment, where they are uh, with cloud solutions, where they are with their current data platform, what are really, again, their needs and pain points from these areas, so we understand uh, what we need to include and cover uh, in our architecture and delivery. So in all these two activities, uh, which uh, were running for six weeks, uh, help us to build a backlog, so a list of requirements from the technical side, but also from the from the business perspective or from the from the user perspective. So after this, we we had the we had the design, we uh, we had the backlog. Uh, so we started the delivery phase uh, of the project, but also obviously from the from the user user research perspective, uh, we learned a lot. So uh, there were different needs and different pain points. And you need really to focus your attention and the delivery for alpha uh, to most valuable uh, parts uh, or most valuable needs. And so we kept on working with the business to, uh, to understand what is the areas of the delivery that will bring the most benefit to the, uh, to the users while we could still approve the whole technology, uh, technology stack uh, for the data service. So uh, luckily, uh, the business uh, who are working with uh, at Homes England are very collaborative, and they want to work with us on this. And uh, on this, and they understood the iterative process, as uh, Richard mentioned, the agile way of ways of working, where we will build together uh, the data model and the visualizations, uh, step by step, sprint by sprint, uh, as we as we bring more and more uh, value to uh, to the to the project. So, uh, our so we are now in the delivery phase. Uh, from the technical perspective, we aim to deliver uh, the core infrastructure components of the, of the data platform. We are going to deliver a data ingestion pipeline. So that's, that's the infrastructure which will bring the data, which will transform the data and surface it uh, into Power BI. And we are working also on the new data models and Power BI uh, reports and dashboards, uh, which are related to those. So now a bit more about the user research. Uh, so based on the uh, stakeholder mapping uh, I mentioned, uh, we identify uh, 34 uh, key individuals which, uh, who we wanted to talk to. Um, and really they covered what, what was very important, the end-to-end -end process. So starting with people who are working with the data, who are collecting the data, who are doing all this uh, manual work in the spreadsheets, uh, through the people who are bringing the different pieces of reports together and creating the final PDF or uh, PowerPoint slides. And on the other hand, the end users who are using those slides and those reports uh, to do their business uh, decisions. So all of these uh, we wanted to cover uh, in, the, in, the, in the user research. And we did one-to-one -one interviews uh, with, as I mentioned, 34 uh, individuals. And the outcomes of the user research um, 
a recording in service blueprints and, and personas. So service blueprint, um, there's a, an example, a small picture on the left side. Um, so it's really a map of the current process. Uh, so how the reports are created at the moment, what are the different stages of the process, um, who participate uh, at different stages of that process, and what are the needs and pain points uh, at the, uh, of, those, uh, of those users. Uh, and also we match that uh, with the kind of technical information. So what kind of systems do they interact with? What, what is the interaction? Uh, how, how, how the data works to them? Um, and, you know, so we covered also the technical aspects. So, and, and everything is recorded in the service blueprints. So, so these are the maps of the current process. And obviously after the project ends, uh, we will have a new service blueprint, which will include the new technologies and the new ways of working, uh, which, which we implement through this project. Uh, and uh, the you uh, one, yeah, uh, um, just a bit more about the personas. Uh, I'm not sure if everybody's familiar who, who, what are personas. So those are a uh, generic representation of groups of uh, certain groups of similar needs and pain points. Uh, so this is really to uh, identify the key roles which, uh, which participate in the process. So for example, report authors, report coordinators and report consumers. And, and an example is on, on the small picture with the four quadrants. And really this is, this is to sum up the needs and the pain points. So the people on the project um, have always on their minds, you know, when they design something, when they deliver something that these are the, the needs, these are the pain points we want to get rid of, these are the needs we want to help with. And these are our users for, who we are delivering this solution to. Now to the technical uh, aspect of things. Um, I'm not going to you know, describe the architecture or uh, I'm, I'm not an architect, uh, uh, but I can talk you through a bit of, um, about the technologies we are using. Um, everything, is, uh, everything is deployed on Azure Cloud. So we are using Azure services and the key components are, uh, are listed there. So Azure Data Factory, uh, so that's basically a component uh, which uh, provides the data pipeline functionality. So, um, this is how we are going to take the data from on-premise sources, what we, how we transform the data through the different stages, uh, and how we are going to uh, present the data through Power BI. Uh, the transformation part of, the, uh, of, of that process is covered by Azure Data, Databricks, and the data is then stored in Azure Data Lake and Azure SQL, um, to which Power BI connects. And Power BI is obviously, you probably know it, uh, a tool which, where you can work with the data, where you can build reports and dashboards, uh, where you can you know, interact with the data or with the data model, which is a surface in that, uh, in that layer. So all uh, standard modern, um, modern technologies uh, which are provided by, uh, by Microsoft. And the, the key features of the, of the solution and why, uh, how, we, how we implemented these technologies is really to support the maintainability, consistency, and reusability of the solution, which means that everything what we do uh, is done uh, through code. Uh, it means that there are no manual, manual steps uh, while building the, uh, the infrastructure. So everything is, is uh, coded. Uh, every change, every single change needs to be updated as a code. Every single change needs to go through a deployment pipeline and it goes through automated tests and through you know, different verification steps. So we ensure that, uh, first of all, there are no manual steps involved. Then this architecture can be, uh, the infrastructure can be built from scratch uh, within uh, you know, several minutes. That all the environments which we are building will be the same because we are still using the same code. And then we ensure this uh, uh, consistency and integrity of the system. And then obviously that will result in a lower maintainability costs uh, and operation costs. Uh, we are now uh, at alpha stage and we have two use cases uh, where we want to prove the, the technology. But obviously if this is successful, uh, then more and more uh, projects, more and more data sets, more and more uh, on-prem uh, systems will be uh, will be moved to this new platform. So we need we needed to make it uh, make it uh, scalable and configurable. So uh, our data pipelines, and we have actually only one data pipeline, uh, is is coded in a way or is implemented in a way that uh, if we want to uh, include a new resource, a new uh, new on-premise source, it's it can be easily done by ch by changing a configuration, uh, by changing parameters. So there is no there is nothing hard coded. Uh, it's very flexible, and we, call, we can accommodate additional additional data. Uh, and this 
scalability is also valid for the data model. So we are using a Kimball dimensional modeling methodology, which basically is about modeling or creating the data model around business processes. So with the business uh, in, in the center of the data model, which means if, uh, if I'm a business user and I look at my business model, I should immediately recognize that, okay, so this is, this is my part of the business. I, I know what I'm looking at. I understand what the data is about and I, and I will know how to work with it if I want to, um, or if I just want to uh, see the dashboards, that's obviously possible as well. So really the technical solution uh, is about the scalability, maintainability, consistency, and that's how we designed it and implemented it. And throughout um, all, of, all of these layers, which I mentioned, uh, uh, we uh, ensure that the security uh, policies are followed, that we have vulnerability scans. So the solution is obviously uh, secured, which is very important. Um, and just to summar, uh, summarize our, our goals, so, so Richard talked about the vision and about the strategy and about, about what we want to achieve with the, with the project. And these are the kind of a smaller goals for the alpha phase, uh, alpha phase of the project where we want to really prove the technology that we can, uh, we can deliver uh, the capabilities uh, Homes England needs through, through this technology I mentioned, through the new data platform service, uh, that we are able to build the new data models uh, with the core information assets for the business. Uh, so they have uh, the data they need. Uh, and obviously a big part of it uh, is we are looking into the potential to reduce manual effort uh, that is currently required to build those reports and dashboards. So throughout the solution, we want to replace those spreadsheets and those manual, manual steps. Uh, so uh, report orders can focus on activities which bring more value to the business uh, and not you know, just copy paste uh, data in spreadsheets. And we will have the data uh, surfaced uh, at Power BI as I mentioned. And, and, and there will be still the dash dashboards and there will be still reports which we will create and some users uh, that's all they need. Uh, and that's, that came from the user research. Some users just want to see the reports and that's enough for them. But some users really want to dig deeper into the data. Some users want to uh, maybe have a different views of, of, on the same data so they can, they can um, build their own reports. And all, all these new, the new solutions will, uh, will allow that. So we can, we can satisfy the first group of the users, but also we can satisfy the users who want to more interact with the data. Uh, and that's, that's how we can uh, address the existing gaps between the end user needs and what is uh, currently produced. And now I hand over to Ben, uh, who will speak about the, our partnership with Homes England. Brilliant, thank you very much for that, Martin. And apologies to Richard, Martin <clears throat> and Sarah, who's now dropped off. I think there's a bit of a dark art trying to go to the next slide before being prompted. Uh, and I've been a bit hasty there on a couple of occasions. So yeah, apologies for that. Um, so as uh, Martin said, I'm going to talk a little bit about our partnership. Um, I think as, as Sarah mentioned, you know, one of the things that Homes have instilled in their digital strategy and vision is around a one-team approach. I think that's something that from the outset of this project, you know, even if we think about pre-mobilization phase, has been really, really important. So the diagram on the right um, kind of, I guess, articulates far better than I'll be able to how we do that. Um, but I think before even kind of, like I said, before that mobilization phase started, there was, there was meetings being set up. It's hard when it's when it's remote as well, right? Ideally, we'd be in the offices in, in Coventry and, and kind of whiteboarding this sort of stuff. So um, it's often a bit more difficult when it's when it's virtual, but there's been, I'm loath to use the word vibe, uh, but there has just been a real good feel about this project from the outset. And, and it does very much feel like one team. And I think that started right at the start when we were agreeing kind of ways of working and, and what we really wanted to achieve from this piece of work. Um, and ultimately that comes back to shared shared goals, I think, and, and you know, our team, as BJ says, working very, very closely and hand in hand with, with the homes and stakeholders and, and wider teams in order to, to deliver that. In terms of kind of collaboration as we've gone through this project, again, ideally we'd be in a, in a room a lot of the time, particularly for key meetings and things, kind of whiteboarding some of this stuff. And, and um, we've obviously had to adapt that to a, to a more virtual world. So ensuring this constant collaboration, knowledge sharing, and keeping a short feedback loop has been really important. So using things like Teams, um, Miro, and Azure DevOps as well. Um, and I think as you'll have heard throughout 
this presentation, one of the really key things here is engaging with the business. Ultimately, we're delivering this data platform for Homes England, the users of the data platform. We want to ensure that, again, it's an agile, iterative delivery. So that continuous engagement with the business is really important. I think that started with um, the, the user research work that we did, which, which the team carried out, which was, which was incredible. But that continuing is important. So when we're doing things like show and tells, it's not just the data team and the data stakeholders from Homes England or the digital community, it's Homes as an entire organization and ensuring that there's that continuous engagement with the business so that they can challenge us. And as Richard said, you know, this is the plan for the moment, but that may change depending on the, the needs of users. And I think that's that approach is really important to ensuring we deliver something that's fit for purpose. Um, communities of practice, Martin, uh, Don, this, this presentation, Shoes again uh, recently in terms of engaging with homes and um, delivery management um, community of practice and there's been you know for each of homes is kind of uh, digital areas and their heads of profession our team have been really in kind of constant contact with with them as well and engaging more broadly so for instance our our data architects have worked very closely with the architecture community at home so I think Gerard's on the call and, and Anaga and people like that there's been kind of continuous um, contact there as well and, and that's something that's been really really important. Um, as we look to strengthen the partnership and, and the other thing is around sustainability you know ultimately we don't want to be um and it's not because of the, the football team that richard supports or, or anything like that uh, i think i can forgive that we don't want to be you know, homes to be dependent on bgss it's about building sustainability for them as an organization um and uh, and i think this kind of constant interaction and knowledge sharing is really important for that um and working in the open you know hopefully this is it's kind of the first of, of many in that respect, I suppose, um, both Homes and, and, and BGSS, I think, are, are big advocates of working in the open and that cross-government collaboration. So um, I think there's a couple of blogs and things that will be coming out to keep you posted on our journey. And we, we kind of widely encourage, I guess, the uh, sharing this. And if you've got any questions or what have you, obviously, we've got the Q&A at the end, but we want this to be very much working in the open and, and advocate that throughout. I think that's it on our partnership. I'm going to hand over to Richard now, who's going to just talk through the future plans before we get to the Q&A. Yeah, th thanks, Ben. Thanks, Martin. And that's really, really great overview. Um, I think I'm just going to just the next slide, if, if you don't mind, Ben, just just, just, uh, just, just a few just a few thoughts that um, um, have sort of occurred to me over, as we put this together and also as we've been speaking, actually, is that um, is the number one thing is, is, is that, as I said at the start, it, this, this isn't necessarily uh, advanced stuff that people aren't, aren't doing elsewhere but we just as just read what ben says we, we want to work in the open we want to just be really sort of trying to understand where other people have hit boundary barriers where other people have sort of overcome things and likewise as we say in that journey i'm really really passionate about working in the open in that respect uh, one thing the elephant in the room about all this is is the governance and the management of it um you can have we could have the the most brilliantly technical solution in the world and um, that we develop which is in those most space age moonshot whatever one of jargon you want to use but if you haven't got the governance around it you're going to hit the same problem as we have with any kind of other d d data platform you haven't got management if you've got um, um multiple people pulling on the same data you're going to get multiple versions of the truth and things like that so we've got to this has got to be a technology technological piece alongside the governance and infra um, uh, inf information management piece that sits alongside it and that's definitely where we get into and actually having all the data or these use cases in the platform that enables us really to sort of to get get those ownership and stewardship questions a bit more easy to 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 uh, to, to get answered really um another thing i'll just definitely advocate is a product management approach to this as well in the future i think we need to be more of that as we take this forward so the idea is that um we treat the you know as i said as a, as a product and we get you know you know as a roadmap there's, there's a real clear distinction about what needs to happen we've probably sort of missed got a bit mixed up in, in turning homes you're going to be just fault there about you know how we take that forward and particularly how you prioritize you can't just do big bang everything our entire estate into one go you've got to prioritize and take that forward so product management is a really really important issue across in data a lot, a lot actually and we, there's a lot of debate about do you have a data specific product manager or is it part of a wider product manager decision and things we, we, we do need to, to get answers on, on quickly and then the final thing is i said before um we, we, we don't we're not we're not scared of just changing direction the user research actually was really really helpful pointing us in the, away from a little bit 
sort of direction we were going on or something um, because it was pointing out that we need to do things in a certain way and, and they need different answers than we thought they did or before so that's really useful use of research and as i said if if as, if you keep that in mind as you move through um it, it doesn't, and and or there's no economic benefit we come to the end of this and we do an assessment then you know we would we'll take a different tack and 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 change we're not we're not fine at that but yeah those are just sort of thoughts to sort of you know like move on the next steps i think ben is the next slide isn't it um yeah so we're going to finalize this mvp a little bit of work to do that in the next three or four weeks we're going to do an internal GDS assessment on Alpha Stage. It's just you know, just a really, really, you know, more and more those we're doing at home digital now, and really, really finding the benefit of how they to change our delivery, digital delivery roadmap delivered for analytics. And I really want to get to a passionate point where people are sort of saying, you know, this is the insight we need. It's not the data we need. It's not the object in a business object database we need. It's not a field. It's not a spreadsheet. It's, this is the insight we need, and then we work collectively as an organisation to deliver that insight using the platform or using other tools and things like that so that roadmap we're going to be sort of working on sort of sort of plan for beta you know if alpha you know advocates we move forward to beta which i'm very very confident it will do um data migration we've got all the bits and pieces happening in homes england which you want to sort of like sort of link in and connect and stuff like that and um the platform not necessarily put everything in the platform but we use a sort of connecting approach a networking approach use, um, rather than just putting everything necessarily in one place and then there's this more uh, that the rest of that data strategy has got to be, you know, perhaps not implemented, but we've got to go actually sort of get a plan in place to go and, you know, sort of deliver that. And I just want to really, you know, we just need to be, it needs to be massively collaborative across, you know, across the organization. It's not in one team or one area. It's everybody working together to, to do that. And as I said, that you know, my fundamental thing, speaking plainly around data literacy and data, things like that. That's, that's, that's really, 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 really uh, important to me. Um, so lots to do. Um, I'm really, really excited. Um, I've been involved in things like this before. Um, I've been, I've been. It's been great the way the team has operated because, as, as Ben said, it's, it's felt everybody's part. It's not been done to us, so we've got people working alongside the BJS guys doing it um, and understanding it. And um, so eventually, we're, the, the beta will have a sort of how we synthesise that into our own organisation and take it forward. So it's, there's, you know, there's a sort of roll-off plan as you move forward in, into into the future. But yeah, that that that's that's really it for future plans. And uh, I think that might bring us to the end, Ben. It does indeed. Thank you very much. It's a seamless transition. Uh, oh, a bit longer. We, I, I think I waffled a bit too much then, Ben. So apologies for everybody um, listening to me. Um, Absolutely not. Uh, who'd have thought uh, data would be quite so interesting? Um, no, thank you very much. That was, that, was, that was great. So I think what we're going to do now, I'm going to stop sharing. And I think there's a couple of questions that have come through. I think one of them has already been responded to, um, but there may be some, some others. Uh, if you have got any questions, um, please do drop them in. You know, we've kind of got, he checks his watch, 10 minutes to go. Um, so if there are any questions, then please, please kind of write to us now in, in that Q&A function via Zoom and we, we can try and answer those. There's one here from, from Eva. So um, she says, you mentioned that you're starting with just one data pipeline. Just wondering how much pushback you've got moving data from on-prem to the cloud and have you had to start off with a fairly non-sensitive data set? Um, do you have ambitions to get uh, PI data onto the cloud? So, so I take on to start with Martin, and then you can come, perhaps come in from a project perspective, if that's okay. So yeah, great, great question. Um, um, it's it's we, 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 we're actually taking data from um, in this initial project for system for on-prem systems. So um, it's not just like one uh, pipeline. So I think it's just we maybe said that's an initial bit. We this this alpha is taking data from a number of different data sources um, at the moment. Um, pushback. So this is part of our wider Homes England Cloud strategy. So we've got our, our wider digital strategies moving um, is to the cloud. I think most owners will be doing that now. So um, um, we haven't had pushback, which is a great question on the sensitive data set and, um, um, and that sort of data and a question that we came up this morning. So this project does actually include sensitive data and moving into the, into the uh, classification. So we've gone through this usual DPIA, DPIA process, ethics process to, 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 to take that forward. Um, actually, because of the way we're doing it in the cloud in, in terms of um, um, securing data more securely for sensitive and, and, and um, personal informa identified information than um, it can actually, actually on the on-prem system, actually it was get put us in a very positive situation with DPIA. But obviously we've got the usual sort of pipeline process of like um, test, dev, um, I've got the, the environment, the right names, but that's what I call them, dev live sort of process. So we wouldn't be pushing through 
into live until we you know we've got the, the, the test data properly and into you know in that respect so um so ambitions yes we've already done that so we've got um, PII data in there um and it's just how the, the, the difficulty there again is the governance question about how you identify what is sensitive and then that's that's where you've got to be, it has to be business knowledge and business understanding um and if, um, we've obviously worked very very hand in hand with the business here and so, so we get that sorted and then we can actually make a plan about how we actually store that information in in, in the cloud Martin, anything to add on that one, or I? Uh, just maybe a, w one or two sentences. So, um, uh, as I mentioned, yes. Yeah, so we have a one one data pipeline which will actually cover all these resources uh, or sources, as Richard mentioned. Um, and then the way how it works is basically behind this pipeline there is a configuration file which lists all the tables which we want to ingest from different uh, sources of the system, and you can basically mark um, which which tables are uh, include PII data, and then the pipeline behaves in a different way uh, than without uh, without the sensitive data. Uh, so yeah, so it's still a one one data pipeline, but it's so configurable. Uh, you can configure it in a way that it behaves you know, differently uh, while that ingesting data from different systems and also taking into account uh, PII data. Uh, having said that, uh, the first step was really to start with the systems which uh, don't include PII data, just to start with, uh, because it's obviously a good, good way how to approach things if you can uh, during the development and then uh, you know, add on uh, the PII data. So, sorry, yeah, I, I probably gave the impression that we just jumped straight in with PIA data. Now, obviously, there's a, there's a proper, proper process going on. I don't want to get sacked. Thanks. That's right. Yeah. Uh, yeah we'll try to avoid that if we can, uh, Richard. That would be, that'd be good. Um, so, let's, we've got a question here from Michelle. Um, thank you very much for your question. Uh, what, if any, Azure applications are going to be used as part of the governance element of the project? So um, again, Martin could come in if I've, I've got mistaken. So at this point in time, <clears throat> we're looking at the cataloging process of Azure, like things like Purview. We're looking at Purview. We haven't made any um, actual TDA, that's our technical design authority decisions on, on, on that. Um, so that is very much around the next step of the project. Um, so we haven't really made any firm decisions on that, but things like Purview are obviously part of the Azure stacks so and what used to be data catalog um, are, are, are not necessarily. So we're not using any sort of ex or tools to Azure at this point in time. Am I correct, Martin? Yeah, that, that's correct. So we are now uh, in the really in the in the core uh, components delivery phase. Uh, so we are about to fi finish uh, finish that part in, in two weeks, uh, which will bring uh, all the components which are required for the data pipeline and for the data transformation. And then the next step will be uh, really to focus more on the governance processes and um, components and services related to that. Right question absolutely yeah it's it's really really important and, and especially when you start seeing the data there it's the governance becomes even more important there was one ben there's also one that i answered by text in in the before as well so um not that wasn't constraining but so just i just want to bring that out just so um chris asked about um um around you know basically what does a, a cloud-based data model look like and i think that's it's actually a very very fair question in the sense that probably um i made assumption you know we made some assumptions um, um, around that people don't understand what a data model is like so take that on board absolutely and just you know sort of to take us in the, in the answer around you know making the uh, data more or simpler you know perhaps i could have done a bit more on that but yeah just data model is obviously what we're talking about in data model terms when when martin talks about Kimball data methodology is that what we're doing is effectively bringing lots of different stuff together um, um, for different parts of the business into a single sort of um, place um, and data model is around how those tables and, ta and, and um, uh, tables and fields connect to each other so, the, so the, the, the purpose really is that at the moment um, and we have like a universe and, and, and report process of getting information out rather than having people access just the output as it is you know and just the answer we're giving people access to actually ask more questions of that information and that data but it's actually relevant to what their area and that's what the Kimball methodology is it's it's it's, it's relevant to their business area but we, we should have perhaps drawn a diagram what a model looked like when we, we could take that on board so brilliant thank you Richard um and it's worth saying as well you know if anyone has got any further questions or well, I can imagine any of you will if you ponder this over the course this afternoon and think of any other uh, any other questions that you may have then please do get in touch with us on you know, LinkedIn or Twitter or, or anything like that, and um, we'll we'll endeavour to sort of get get back to you uh, as soon as we possibly can as well. Um, a couple more minutes left. Just going to see if there's any more that come through. Um, give it another minute or so. Silence is golden, as they say. Um, 
I think that might be it. I'll give it another 30 seconds or so. Um, if there aren't, a, a massive thank you for, for joining us and giving up uh, part of your Monday afternoon to, to, to listen to us. I think, um, I'd say, you know, from, from a BGSS perspective and a, and a host perspective, delighted to be playing a part in, in service this week. It's something I think we're, we're kind of both incredibly passionate about. And as we say, that kind of working in the open is something that hopefully we'll continue to do into the future phase of the project. And there'll be vlogs and, and, and things like that coming out over the, over the course of the next um, few weeks. So, um, yeah, a, a massive thank you for joining. Um, and, and yeah, have a, have a great end of the afternoon. Brilliant. Thank you.